Welcome to the She Found Motherhood podcast. I'm Dr. Sarah, and today I'm talking to Sierra Richard. She's a PharmD and women's health and pediatric clinical pharmacist for the University of Missouri Women's and Children's Hospital. In her free time, she creates educational content about women's health topics for social media platforms, including Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok, under the name Happy Farm Life. Sierra and I today talk all things COVID vaccine when it comes to pregnancy, postpartum, and trying to conceive. For those listeners who are pregnant, if you're looking for high quality prenatal course, then you should check out our Pregnancy to Parenthood Masterclass in Labor and Delivery. Our Masterclass takes you from anxious and overwhelmed to confident during your childbirth experience. It's a complete online prenatal course where we cover the weeks leading up to delivery, the birth experience itself, and we talk a lot about what to expect in the postpartum stage. Head on over to our website at www.shefoundhealth.ca backslash masterclass to find out more. We'll link to it in the show notes below. Now we'll get into the podcast right after this. Welcome to the She Found Motherhood podcast. We are Sarah and Alicia, two doctor moms who are creating a community rich with high quality information to support people through the journey from pregnancy to parenthood. Our goal is to empower with knowledge and decrease the anxieties during this time in our lives. We cover topics from fertility through the fourth trimester with the odd birth story sprinkled in. Come join us on Instagram or Facebook at she.found.motherhood or check us out on our website at www.shefoundhealth.ca. Some of these podcasts have been sponsored, which allows us to continue putting out free, amazing content. But don't worry, this won't affect our advice or recommendations. And we only partner with companies we know and trust or have come highly recommended to us by you, our listeners. She Found Health is meant for general medical information only. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The information you hear does not apply to every situation. If you have questions or if you've received different advice, please contact your healthcare provider. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions that you may have regarding a medical condition. The views expressed by She Found Motherhood and our guests are not representative of any institution with which we are affiliated. Hello, Sierra. Thank you so much for joining me today. So guys, like I said in the intro, Sierra is a clinical pharmacist at the University of Missouri Women's and Children's Hospital. And she and I are here today to talk about the COVID-19 vaccine for those trying to conceive, pregnant, and lactating. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. Um, So we briefly chatted before we started recording, and we thought we would start by just explaining a little bit about the vaccine, how it works, the ingredients, and a little brief understanding of the trial. So Sierra, can I turn it over to you for that part? So currently the vaccines that are approved are Pfizer and Moderna, and it makes it simple for us because both of those are a vaccine using what's called mRNA technology. And while this is a new technology to be approved and be used, it's not brand new. It's something that has actually been studied pretty well and has been out for 10 or so plus years as far as really looking at it in detail to use it as a vaccine. So How this technology works is it's really cool and innovative. It's probably gonna change how we do vaccines in the future. So this is probably not the last mRNA vaccine we're gonna see. So how this works is you have only this little piece of mRNA and they kind of put it in what we call a lipid bubble. And we'll talk about the ingredients in a minute minute because that's an important part of how this vaccine works but we put it in this lipid bubble, which is just a little fat bubble to get it into your cell. And what it does is it goes into the cytoplasm of your cell and your cell sees this little strand of RNA. This mRNA is just a little piece of the spike protein of the coronavirus. And I wish I could show you a picture because it's just this itty bitty little jut out of the coronavirus. It's not the whole virus. So you can't get the, uh, you can't get COVID from this little piece of mRNA. And so your body will replicate that little piece of mRNA spike protein so your body can make antibodies against it. So your body sees this little piece of mRNA that has been replicated in your cell and it goes, that's not supposed to be there. And so it takes and 
amounts and immune response against it, basically. So if you were ever to get COVID-19 or be exposed to it again, your body would react immediately to get rid of it. And that's kind of the idea of how this vaccine works. As far as the ingredient list, this is actually one of the shortest ingredient lists mm -hmm. I have ever seen for totally. a vaccine, which is, yeah, it's crazy how few that or how few ingredients they needed. So there's 11 ingredients total, I think for both vaccines. And they kind of are broken down into four different parts. So you have your mRNA strand, which is one ingredient. It's um, different concentrations in both vaccines, but both have shown pretty similar efficacy. So it doesn't really matter in that sense. And then the next component is lipid molecules to make that fat bubble that goes around because that mRNA is very delicate. So we can't just inject straight mRNA into you and it go into the cell where we want it to. So it has to be protected in that bubble. And so there's several ingredients that are components of that bubble. And then the other set of ingredients is salts. Those are really to balance the pH, to keep the... Um, bubbles stable to keep everything nice and happy inside the vaccine while we're waiting for it to transport to you. And then the last is sugar, which is again, another stabilizing molecule. So while there are 11 ingredients, they're kind of fall into one of those four categories. What was the next thing I was gonna talk about? Sorry. <laughs> no, no, I know. I asked you a lot of questions at once. Um, so let me clarify. What happens is we have this little lipid nanoparticle filled with mRNA. So it's like a fat, a tiny fat bubble with one little piece of messenger RNA goes into your muscle cell. And that's where all the action happens. Right. And then it gets degraded. This, this vaccine doesn't go through your entire body. Correct. It just, those cells make the spike protein and then the spike protein, your immune system sees that and makes the antibody. So it's not like the vaccine is going to be throughout your entire bloodstream. That's correct. It's localized into that muscle cell. And the degradation time for it being in that muscle cell is like 10 to 20 days. After 10 to 20 days, it just kind of depends on each person. Everybody breaks down molecules at a different rate. But after 10 to 20 days, it's completely gone. That original component is gone. Um, but what is left is the antibodies against the virus spike protein, which is what is on the outside of the coronavirus cell. So when you see that picture. I know everyone's seen that red molecule picture of the coronavirus at this point. It's all over the news. It's just one of those little jets out of there. And so all that it's going to see is what's on the outside, which is what your body would react to anyway, if you had the full virus in your system. So instead of giving a full virus, um, live or dead, we are giving just that little piece that your body's going to react to anyway. It's so cool. Um, so the next thing I think we were going to talk about briefly is the, the studies, because there has been some concern um, people raise about how quick this vaccine came um, from, you know, from testing through to approval. Um, and so I think you can shed us some light on why that was so quick and how they actually studied it. So what I learned quickly in pharmacy school, when we started learning about this process is there is a lot of breaks between them being able to do anything in a normal setting. So pretend the pandemic is not happening and we were trying to get something approved. There's a lot of time where they are spending, trying to get grant money in order to do their research. So they'll hit a roadblock or find out that they need additional resources or money to do a part of the trials. And they have to stop everything they're doing, try to get a grant, which could take six months to a year. And so there's a lot of breaks in between for that. In addition, every time you submit for approval for review to any organization um, here in the United States, the FDA, you're waiting in between all of those periods. And again, it could be six months to a year, 18 months sometimes in between hearing after each phase of your studies to get approved to move on to the next phase. So you just have these long periods of waiting, which is why um, medications and drugs take so long to get approved. It's not that the studies themselves are taking that long. It is the waiting process in between this. Exactly. The other thing that's important to realize from speed perspective is, like I said before, this is not brand new technology. Mm -hmm. The first off, coronaviruses themselves have been studied for a while for vaccine purposes, particularly after the last SARS outbreak. Mm -hmm. There was research into that because, again, at the beginning, like we didn't know here, how much this was going to spread. So 
they immediately did the same thing that we did this time where we are looking to try to figure out what we can do to vaccinate people against it. So we already had some research on coronaviruses as a whole. So we were just applying that to this particular strand. And then um, the mRNA technology has been looked at and has, I think Moderna actually has like 10 or so different vaccines that they currently have under investigation using mRNA technology. So this is just applying what we already knew to a new vaccine. So we were not starting at ground zero. I think that's very important to realize. A lot of people are like, new virus, ground zero. That's not where we were starting at all. Yeah. And the process, like I said, has a lot of breaks in between it. This was put all the resources at this vaccine. So this is what happens when you have the money and the resources to focus on one thing that's very important. You also have the best scientists in the world taking their focus off of whatever other vaccines or whatever other drugs or studies they were doing and they're putting all of their attention mm -hmm. into one. Mm -hmm. So you have resources behind this that we have never seen before in modern times. This is not something that we do frequently. And you don't have that delay process because you have the funding they need. And if you don't, they're gonna get it immediately. Yeah. If, yeah. <laughs> if you need, um, approval from you know the governing bodies in the country that was fast tracked the second they were getting that information boom it was getting reviewed it was you know looked at probably that day or the next day it was right away so you have lost all of that downtime in between each phase of the study that usually is what takes so long in the process so what's really important here is not how long did it take but how long was it studied and that is one thing that I think was very impressive with what they did. So most long-term side effects for vaccines occur within 45 days. We have a lot of great data to show that. If there's going to be any sort of reaction that is truly due to the vaccine, most of them are you know, pretty quickly within the first 72 hours, but the first 45 days, we really don't see any reactions after that from previous vaccines. So they made sure that we had at least 60 days of data out from the people who were in the trials. So we had even, you know, a few extra days outside of that 45 day window for the people who were in the trial to see if they had any reactions. And what we've seen is no. And like I said, the actual mRNA is out of your system in like 20 days. So yeah. if you're most likely going to have a reaction, it's going to be in that period that it's truly in your body. Um, so we have that data and that's really helpful, I think, to know that that time frame is good. And the other thing is the number of people in these yeah. trials, which was just crazy to me to see because a lot of our drugs approved, I work in pediatrics as well as women's health. So I see medications that are approved with like a hundred patients in them because kids, they're just small population. And, you mm -hmm. know, we have some of these rare diseases for them. So to see over 40,000 people in the trials for each vaccine, you know, independently is just a crazy number and much higher than we see for a lot of vaccines that are currently approved even. So knowing that we had so many people in these trials, um, I think also just is a testament to what they did. They did a great job rolling this out. Um, and I think that's really impressive. Oh, me too. I'm so grateful for that. <laughs> So moving on to the, I'm sure, issue that everyone wants to hear us talk about is the vaccine in pregnant people, in lactating people, and in people trying to conceive. So why don't we start by talking about um, the, like, the recommendations for vaccination in pregnant people, the theoretical, I'm doing air quotes here, guys, the theoretical risks in pregnancy, um, and we can just have a conversation around that. Sure. So in pregnant individuals, the current recommendations, I think pretty much have been now, at first it was kind of, you know, everybody had a little bit different wording, but I think a lot of it has been standardized from the CDC to the World Health Organization. I know the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine kind of have all joined in and on the same page now that. Um, it's really a personalized decision yeah. and it's looking at every individual person's risk versus benefits for the vaccine. 
And like you said, all of the risk associated with the vaccine currently is completely theoretical. We've not seen any risk in the clinical trial setting because pregnant women were excluded, which is not uncommon. Um, it is unfortunate that that's how trials are done, but it is not uncommon for us to see that. So we're in the same boat that we are with pretty much anything that gets approved, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, but it's all what could possibly happen. So we do have some studies and we call it a DART model, which is the studies that are done in rats for us to see. The, um, I haven't seen the Pfizer data yet, but the Moderna data didn't show anything that was concerning, which is kind of our first place we would find a red flag if there was one. Mm -hmm. um, so that's good to know. Second, we did have patients who did get pregnant after getting one dose or two doses of the vaccine. So. We do know that at some point in time, especially the ones who got it in between, were pregnant or possibly pregnant when they got it or shortly afterwards. And um, there's not been any adverse effects reported from those patients. So we do know that, you know, you can successfully deliver. Um, some of them have delivered at this point after getting the vaccine. And so everybody is going to be different. And, you know, I think right now the people who are being offered the vaccine are people who are the highest risk of getting COVID-19. And the thing is, and you can, I'm sure, attest to this as well, we know that there are risks associated with getting COVID-19 in pregnancy. Yeah. Um, I don't think anybody is going to be able to argue that with the data that we've seen, even if it's limited. Mm -hmm. We've seen that it, you're more likely, if you're pregnant, to get um, put in the ICU because mm -hmm. of your disease. You're going to be more likely to be put on a ventilator um, the data on, you know, miscarriage as well as uh, premature birth is a little bit mixed, but, you know, we still know that that's a possibility. And another thing is we know that fever for a prolonged period of time can also yeah. cause risk in pregnancy. And we know that COVID-19, a lot of patients do have a high mm -hmm. fever for yeah. a prolonged period of time. So those are all risks that we know with COVID-19. With the vaccine, the theoretical risk, I'm going to do the air quotes as well. <laughs> Um, that I have heard a couple theories that people have brought up and concerns, and I think it's good to talk about those, Three, yeah. um, but knowing that we have no data to say that this is true. Um, so the first is just mounting a remaining immune response, especially in the first trimester. People are concerned about that because it does put stress on the body. Um, but what I like to think about is while we're using a different mechanism to produce an antibody response, an immune response to a vaccine, we do have data in the flu vaccine to say that you can get the flu vaccine in the first trimester and it's not going to increase your risk of miscarriage. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I've seen some scary headlines from people like, I got the vaccine and then I miscarried. Um, you know, those are scary headlines. I'm not going to lie. And it's probably, you know, there are cases where that's going to be true. But the thing to think about here is, unfortunately, one in four pregnancies exactly. will end in loss. Um, and so we say this all the time in pharmacy, but correlation does not mean causation, exactly. which basically means just because the vaccine was given in a, you know, before a miscarriage happened doesn't mean that it caused the miscarriage to happen. And yeah. so we won't know that data and if there is that risk officially until we have seen, you know, results from people who have gotten it. And that's, that's just the reality of anything that we give in pregnancy. We don't see those results until after we have some data behind them. But theoretically, this, like we said, asked locally in the muscle cell in the arm. So it's very unlikely that it's going to get anywhere near the fetus, anywhere near the placenta. Um, so, you know, mounting that immune response, your body is going to do that naturally. It does that throughout pregnancy and it's mm -hmm. going to do that to protect the fetus. So yeah. in theory, that shouldn't be a concern. Um, while it is, you know, possible, very unlikely that that is going to cause issues. Secondly, is people are worried about inflammation in the placenta, but again, it acts locally. It shouldn't be getting okay. anywhere near the placenta. So that should be something that's not likely. So what we have seen and what has been said by organizations across the board is the theoretical risk of any complications that are different than what we're seeing in the general population for pregnant people is very low. Agreed. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that that's the message. Like we can't tell people what to do, um, yes. but we can tell you that 
your risks of getting COVID-19 and the risk of severe disease and the things you mentioned like hospitalization, ventilation, and, and scarier things like maternal death are higher and those are known risks of COVID-19. And I cannot think of a pathophysiologic me mechanism that we would see those effects from a vaccine, right? I would completely agree. And I mean, that's, you know, as a pharmacist, that's what we, we think totally. in pathophys, we think totally. in mechanism of action. And um, I've looked at it a lot, you know, myself, and I trust what all these organizations are saying. I mean, mm -hmm. these are organizations with some of the greatest, you know, greatest infectious disease experts. And I would agree with their judgment on this, that, you know, okay. mechanistically, I can't find a way that pregnant persons would be in a different situation than the general population. Totally. I read through like every, every recommendation I could find before we did this podcast. And it's like the SOGC. So that's our Canadian governing OBGYN body, the ACOG, MFM, American Breastfeeding Academy, CDC, you name it. They all agree. And even the SOGC statement goes so far to say the risks are unknown, which we would agree um, because we don't have the data yet, but no yes. red flags or hypothesized mechanisms for potential harm. So I can't think of it like a a clearer guidance to say, if you're at risk of getting COVID-19, get the vaccine. I would uh, agree. And I think the other important thing to bring up here is, you know, no matter what you decide, it is your choice and really? you should support in that because I think it's, you know, totally reasonable for people because there's no data to choose not to, if they are at very low risk of getting disease, you know, if you're stay at home, you're not out and about and you make that decision, you should be supported in that. Um, I think everybody should be having this discussion with their own healthcare providers about their own risks. Um, because I think, you know, what you hear on the news and the media, I think, especially here in the United States, I don't know what your headlines are looking, but we had some scary headlines that weren't total facts. Mm -hmm. They weren't presenting all the evidence. Of course, you just, you know, some people see the headlines and they're like, that's all they read, you know? And they don't read further to see what the actual recommendations have been. So I think it's just important to have a conversation and then, you know, making the best decision for you. But I totally agree. If you're at that high risk, um, you know, it's really something that could prevent further complications if you were to get COVID-19. Exactly. I, I couldn't agree more with that, like individualized assessment, because you need to consider your risk of exposure. And we know that like, look at us, we're both females, like the majority of healthcare providers in the US, and I'm sure in Canada, are women, right? So yep. if you're a healthcare provider, and you're at risk, that's a consideration. And then other underlying medical conditions that could put you at higher risk, right? So um, it is totally individualized and an important discussion to have with your provider. Absolutely agree. Should we talk about breastfeeding and lactating people? Yes, that would be a great place to go next. So <laughs> When it comes to um, lactating persons, um, the recommendations change a little bit in the sense that we have no data to support that there's any risk in breastfeeding at all. And actually there could be some benefits. We know that with other vaccine, there are definitely benefits um, to getting vaccinations while you are breastfeeding and that the antibodies can potentially be passed in breast milk. We know all of those theories. Um, I can't think of a single vaccine that is currently on the market that is not recommended to be given in breastfeeding. If it's a recommendation, you can go ahead and get it breastfeeding. There's no delays. There's no concerns with that. And so based on how this um, vaccine works, we expect it to be similar to what we have already on the market. We don't foresee any issues that are different than the general population. And like I said, we anticipate that, um, and there's starting to be a few smaller trials come out. I saw one the other day. I haven't got to read it yet, but I'm excited to, that was actually looking at some of the people who got it early on that are breastfeeding now. Oh, cool. And um, if the antibodies are in the milk. So I think that came out like a day or two ago. Um, so we're starting to see that there actually might be some data to back that up as far as the benefits mm -hmm. of it in breastfeeding but there are no, really no theoretical risk in the breastfeeding population yeah. that are any different than the general population. So um, if you're breastfeeding and you are eligible to get the vaccine, go ahead and get it. That's the recommendation at the time. So. 100%. And, and I've heard a concern about, you know, well, what if the vaccine 
itself, the mRNA lipid nanoparticle got into the breast milk, which again is like, I, I don't see how that could happen, but if it did, the, it would be degraded in the infant's gut, right? It wouldn't even get into the, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, like, I mean, mRNA itself, like I said, it's a very delicate little molecule. I mean, it, it just breaks down, it's a protein. So your body is gonna break it down like any protein if it's given in the gut. That's why we can't give this vaccine orally because it's not gonna do anything if we were to, you know, take and have that, you know, mRNA and a lipid nanoparticle particle and take it orally, it would be broken down before we could do anything with it. Um, the same thing with like the lipid component of it, that's just fat, you know, little yeah. fat molecules. So those would be broken down as well, just like they would if they were any fat. Mm -hmm. And then the other components are salts, which are not harmful and sugar, which you know, sugar. sugar. Yeah. <laughs> Babies are going to like the sugar. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. exactly. So no, like no theoretical risks, right? A hundred percent agree. No with theoretical you. risks that we can think yeah. of. No. And actually do you, um, have you heard of the pregnancy pandemic guide on Instagram? They're based out of Toronto. Um, no, I have not. Yeah. They're, so they're similar to, to what Alicia and I do. So they're, um, maternity providers and they just on Monday posted a link to a pre-publication about a case study of a, a, a breastfeeding person who got the vaccine. Um, oh no, it was a pregnant person who got the vaccine and they tested the cord blood and it had antibodies and this pregnant person did not have COVID. So that oh, is, that is awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's and exciting to see things are coming. Yeah. That's really exciting. And you know, that is one thing we already, you know, do that with other vaccines. So you know, the Tdap, for example, that is given in pregnancy. It's recommended for the reason of, you know, protecting the fetus mm -hmm. um, after delivery. So, you know, the theoretical side of that, it's nice to see we have some, at least one person that, you know, <laughs> we're seeing those benefits. Yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, things are coming, right? This is really exciting. Um So we've talked about pregnancy and lactating. So the last category, and we get a lot of questions about this, is for people who are trying to conceive. So do you wanna talk about the recommendations you guys have down in the States? Yeah, cause it is a little bit different. So yeah. we were talking about that beforehand. So in the United States, our current recommendations is similar to the breastfeeding group where it's, we don't see any theoretical risk of infertility. Um, again, locally in the muscle, in your arm, should not affect your reproductive organs whatsoever. Mounting immune response to a vaccine should not affect your fertility whatsoever, um, no matter the technology that you're using. So we currently do not see any risk in, you know, in the trying to conceive population. There is no theoretical mechanism that could cause infertility from this that we can foresee. Um, and like we said, we, there have been patients who got the vaccines then have subsequently gotten pregnant and are currently being followed. So we will have some data from them hopefully shortly. Um, but, you know, we know that people have been able to conceive, conceive successfully after getting the vaccine. We do have some data for that. Um, not much, unfortunately, but we do have some. So basically, if you are trying to conceive in the United States, they recommend that you go ahead and get the vaccine if you are eligible and the one dose and then maybe you get pregnant in the middle of that what do you do they say go ahead and get dose two there's no need to delay trying to conceive um, based on our recommendations in the united states and you could just get the vaccine if you get pregnant in the middle of the two just go ahead and get the second one and continue on with your pregnancy yeah. Yeah. And I read that too. And it's interesting because the Canadian guidelines from NACI, which are our national, uh, which is our national governing body around immunizations, recommend ideally to delay pregnancy by 28 days. And I'm not really sure. I couldn't find sort of any references or where they got that from. Um, and also they recommend trying to complete both series. But again, I think if you are like a high risk of getting the disease, whether you're a healthcare frontline worker or whether in your community with a big outbreak and you're offered the vaccine, I would get it, right? I would get that second dose. Um, and I think, I mean, I suspect that recommendation is just based on perhaps in some of our communities, like we don't have the same rates that we're fortunate not to have the same rates in the, in the, that you have in the U S so um, 
So I would say definitely if you're trying to conceive, I would still get the vaccine, right? Because the risks, again, of COVID-19 in pregnancy are higher than getting the vaccine, right? So it's all it all comes down about balancing risk, right? Yeah. And I mean, um, I feel like I use the words risk versus benefits all the time. I know, I know. Um, I know, but you have to, right? Yeah. I mean, it's all that balancing scale and it comes down to what you're comfortable with as well. So, you know, what amount of risk are you comfortable with and knowing what your benefits are, you know, where does that fall on the scale for each individual person? And, you know, no healthcare provider can tell you that they can help you balance that risk for yourself. And I think that's why it's so important. I know I already said that, but to have discussions with your healthcare professionals, because, you know, as individuals, we're also a little bit biased in our in our own judgment on what we have preconceived notions of and those things. So having a discussion with an outside person that can just give you the facts, give you their professional recommendations, and also usually can bring into light other things that maybe you weren't thinking about mm-hmm. um, can be so beneficial for you as an individual to make this decision. Uh, I think it's important to know that no woman has to make this decision alone. They mm-hmm. should be using and their healthcare team to make this decision. And it's not something you have to just learn everything on your own and go after this by yourself. Um, whether you're deciding to get it or not get it, it's something that is really should be a team-based approach. And you definitely don't have to be alone in that. Absolutely. And I would say that exactly for like anywhere in your pregnancy journey. So if you're trying to conceive and you're not sure, talk to your care provider, right? Like we can help you have that discussion. And sometimes it's really hard to flesh out what the risks and benefits are. And we may have some more insight into that. You know, if you've got other medical conditions that you weren't really thinking might impact it, but it could, you know, I think those are important discussions to have and and not to sort of sit and think I have to make this decision by myself. Absolutely. And I think I have Um, some friends that are, you know, in that trying to conceive or breastfeeding phase. And even them as healthcare professionals went to their healthcare professionals because they're like, you know, I'm me. And so it's very different thinking about it for yourself. Um, But that outside perspective helped them decide to make, you know, their own decisions as well. So even healthcare professionals are having to go through, you know, through this process with somebody else. Totally. I know. And, and I think that's the most important thing is like seek out the information and, and I'll put some links in the show notes to all the different um, uh, statement recommendation statements from all the governing bodies. Um, But talk to somebody, you don't have to make this decision by yourself. And the other thing I was going to add is what I can put in the show notes and here, you probably know about this is that there's like an international registry, right? Um, So if you got the vaccine while you were pregnant or breastfeeding, I think. I think there, I know that there is one, at least in the United States for breastfeeding as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'll put that link in too, because that's really helpful, right? We're going to get more, if we get people that are joining the registry. So basically all you do is if you had the vaccine while you're pregnant or breastfeeding and you join, then if you have any adverse effects, they'll find out about them. Right. So that's sort of, we can do bigger, bigger studies again, in quotation, um, in pregnant and breastfeeding people when the, the vaccines themselves weren't studied in this population. Yeah. And I mean, that's really the data that we're going to have because, um, with where the vaccine is now, we're not going to see the same randomized clinical trials that we have seen in the general population. It's just not going to happen. I mean, there's the money reasons for it and the consent reasons for it. Um, you know, they have their reasons why they're not going to do that, but this is the data that we're going to get. This is what we're going to be able to use to hopefully in the future, make recommendations Mm -hmm. that are data-based. It's going to be based on the population. And thankfully there are a lot of women who are joining these registries. Mm -hmm. So we should be able to gather quite a bit of information. And, um, even if, you know, you're not in those registries and you find out later that you were pregnant, you can also report any adverse effects um, as well, just to a general registry mentioning that you're pregnant and that data can be collected as well. So it's just important to, if, you know, if you're having adverse effects and you are in that pregnant or breastfeeding population to report any data that you do have. Yeah. It's really helpful. You know, we learn from each other. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Sierra, do you want to summarize what we talked about? Do you feel that you can do that? (laughs) Um, 
so basically we talked about how the vaccine works. It works locally, very unlikely to affect the placenta or the fetus if you are currently pregnant. So the recommendation currently stands that if you are pregnant, it is a risk versus benefit analysis for you. Um, theoretical risk of the vaccine is very low and there are potential benefits and we will hopefully have more data so we can give a solid, more solid recommendation. But right now, if you're at high risk, um, you know, the vaccine will likely be more beneficial to you than harmful. And there's very little risk to that. Um, in the breastfeeding population, there once again is likely benefit and very low theoretical risk. So the recommendation is the same as the general population. If you are eligible to get the vaccine, go for it, go ahead and get it. Um, in the trying to conceive populations where things get a little bit different. So in the United States, our current recommendation is to go for it. Um, but the Canadian recommendations is potentially wait that 28 days afterwards, but that'll be up to you as there's mm -hmm. once again, no theoretical risk has been determined for that, and there can definitely be benefits in preventing COVID-19 disease um, while trying to conceive. Couldn't have summarized it better myself. <laughs> so thanks so much for joining me today. I think it's so timely. I'm literally going to publish this podcast tomorrow um, because so many people are wanting just really clear, easy to understand information, and you did an incredible job. Um, I feel like I understand the vaccine even better than I did before. So thank you so much, Sierra. It's been a pleasure having you. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for listening. Make sure to check out our website at www.shefoundhealth.ca and to sign up for our community for weekly bump blasts. Make sure to check us out on Instagram or Facebook at she.found.motherhood and head on over to your favorite podcast app and leave a review and a five-star rating. If you enjoyed this podcast, take a pic of yourself listening to it and share it on social. Make sure to tag us on it so we know to keep making them.